always something good about mom. What was she like? She was always helping others out. You think she's still watching over us? I mean, look around the show. Ain't nobody watching over us. Get off. So it's just us. Nah, ugly little kids. You're battling me in. I don't think you understand how comebacks work. Doors open, genius. Why are you always hanging around a place anyway? We'll protect you guys. No one in this neighborhood likes you. This is with the sale and the discount. There's taxes on these things. You people always trying to rip us off. You people? Ah, that's true. Any smaller sizes, you're gonna have to wait a few years till your little midget feet can fit them. Shut up. <laughs> in the wake of the Rodney King jury verdict, I've ordered the Justice Department to help restore order in Los Angeles. Yo, what does that even mean? Oh, gook? In Korean, it just means country. Why is she? Hey, Camilla, get your stuff. You've been going down to them gook stores, and not your friends, they're using you. They treat me like that! Family. Whoever said love don't cost a thing lied. I couldn't begin to tell you about all of the things I lost. It's not just you, it was me too. Love. Never understand my pain. Never understand my pain. Riding out of old the road. And I'm drinking out of bottle wise. I've been driving, stay in my lane. Stay in my lane. When I started to cry, see the rain look like tears down my window pane. Thanks for having me. This movie is an incredible accomplishment. It's beautiful. We were just talking about it backstage. You, you told me some details about it that I don't know if you're public about, but like, you know, what, what it took to make this movie, and it's an incredible achievement. It's beautiful. And there's one thing that I also hope that it does, which we kind of talked about backstage, which is remind people about this movie called La Haine yes. that you said was a big influence on it. Can you talk about that being an influence? Uh, yeah, uh, I saw that movie... Um... You know, I, I, I found it later. Um, so I saw it a few years ago, and uh, it just, I, I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. And, you know, there were echoes of sort of, uh, you know, what was going on in L.A. during the, and it was around the same time. Um, Made in the early 90s? Yeah. But, yeah. So it was around the same time that this story takes place, and I, I felt like, wow, there's some big comparisons here, and also, you know, uh, kids just trying to, to, to make in just blue collar and, and feeling like, uh, you know, displaced. And um, so to me, when I watched that film, I was like, wow, you know, this is such a, this is exactly the type of film that I would like to make, which is why it was such an influence for this film. So talk about, excuse me, talk about where the idea for this film came from outside of, you know, that influence, but wanting to talk about sort of uh, tribalism with, uh, at a specific time where tribalism was kind of, it was, it, it was bursting and things were sort of red hot. Yeah. Um, well, personally, uh, you know, my dad had a, had a business in, in Paramount, basically right across the street, uh, right across a bridge from East Compton. And, um, we got looted. We got looted on the last day of the riots, and uh, we got completely demolished. And um, so, you know, when I heard there's a few other LA riots films being made, and I've even auditioned for some of them over the last 10 years, uh, I just felt like, you know, there could be another unique perspective, which is from a Korean American, which I felt wasn't being addressed. Um, but more importantly, I felt that. Well, I'll also, say, the Asian American immigrant story is rarely addressed in, yeah. in in our country for for whatever reason. I'm sure it's not a good reason mm -hmm. or good reasons. For whatever reason, it seems like that is the sort of immigrant story that yeah. is consistently sort of left out of the picture. Absolutely, and like you know, uh, if you see how Asian American, I, you know, I don't want to. Well, it is a race thing, but but you know, if you see how Asian Americans are represented in the media. Uh, you know, being an actor for 16 years, I've run the gamut on the type of roles I've been allowed to play. And I'm not, you know, I don't need to be, me personally, I don't need to be the hero, but let's accurately represent. So these guys are just two blue collar guys just trying to make it through the day instead of, you know, and they're not trying to run a Fortune 500 company. They're not accountants. They're not trying to be doctors or lawyers. They're just, they're just trying to make enough money uh, to survive. So that's... That, that was a really important aspect for me. Um, and, you know, they just, they just, they're just, I'm, I'm making them human, you know? They're brothers, they fight. They, they, 
<laughs> I mean, you know, if you ever watch a film, David, he wants to be like the first Korean R&B singer. That's ridiculous. <laughs> he's, he's not bad. He's good. I mean, he's a good singer, but like, you know, in 92, forget about it, you know? Like, it's never going to happen, you know? And, and, you know, but another thing to mention, though, this is just as much an African-American film as it is uh, a Korean-American film. And as you can see from the cast, it's is diverse as hell. Um, so that's that, that was something very important to me. Well, it's also a neglected idea that uh, that these that, that immigrant communities are incredibly diverse, and while sometimes they're slightly divided in terms of neighborhoods, there is they're still very living close in close yeah. quarters, you know. So this is all about Korean American immigrants uh, living and, and living within the African American community, and vice versa. More importantly, for me, this film really is about friendship. Uh, it's a film about friendship between Eli and and Camilla. And, um, amazing, the amazing actress who plays. Yo, yeah, and and the most amazing thing is I found her in South Central LA uh, at a community art center called the Fernando Pullum Art Center. Um, she. Did you find her? Did you walk in and ask for a kid? Well, you know, at first, at first, basically, you know, at first I auditioned. You, her. you, <laughs> you, you pulled look her like out. You'd yeah. be a great actress. Um, but at first I uh, auditioned a bunch of Nickelodeon Disney stars, and they all acted like they were selling toothpaste. Or they were like, you know, I don't know. They were so polished. You know, even when I was doing <laughs> improv with them, they had even rehearsed the improvs. They like, I, I, their parents are like so savvy that they're like, this situation can't happen. And I couldn't shake them of it. So I, I was I'm like. from South Central and I'm going to make it today. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Like, you know, Annie, you know, like tomorrow we're going to go and, you know, make sure that we have enough to eat. I don't know. Like it's. Make sure there's no looting. <laughs> yeah, there's no looting. Yeah, but. um. So, you know, I started calling all the, the, the black churches in the greater Los Angeles area, and then also we, that's how we landed on Fernando Pullum through a recommendation from a friend. Fernando Pullum, you know, opened his center with open, open arms, and, um, you know, I, I uh, saw Simone Baker, that's her real name, Simone Baker, the, the first day we got there, and I just automatically knew. Um, what did she do? What made you know? She was just hanging out, and just just the way she her energy and just, she was very, just, first of all, uh, gravitational. I just was like, who is that girl? Like, she had, it's so positive and so, you know, because for this film, um, there are dark moments, but then there's a lot of levity to the film as well. That she brings. That a lot she of the time. brings, yeah. yeah, and I was looking for that because I want her to be the resilient one that bridges these two communities. Uh, so that's the type of, of energy that I was looking for. Um, so, you know, I asked Fernando Poem if I could beat her, and I said, hey, have you ever thought about being an actress? She's like, no, I want to be a singer. And uh, I said, hey, how about this? Why don't you come and sing in my film? You know, I'll, I'll write you a little song, and would that be interesting to you? And she's like, I don't know. And I was like, well, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna audition some people here tomorrow. Would you mind coming? And basically, uh, she didn't tell her mom. She went home, she prepared the lines on her own, and she came in and just, just crushed it. And uh, I didn't find out from her mom till later that her mom had no idea that she even auditioned because it was like a summer camp. Um, so yeah, just was so blessed to, to find her. It's a, sort of a weird question, but talk about that gravitational pull that you talk about because it's a, it's an element of being on camera and acting that people don't talk about a lot, which is like what drives someone to get cast, what drives someone in a movie is sometimes even if they can't act, I mean, fortunately she can, yeah. gravitational pull is so much, it's just charisma, it's such a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, some people call it like the it factor, yeah. uh, the the X factor, <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but uh, yeah, you just, it's just, some people, you know, they have like a really nice energy, but you know, that energy might not work for every film. I mean, it's just that, she, I mean, she's gonna go on and do amazing things, but, but uh, it was just perfect for what I was looking for. Uh, now you have, for, for, for a young person who has never really acted before, you have her doing some pretty dramatic scenes. Mm -hmm. One scene in particular where she's on the ground and she's crying and she's fighting. How did you get her to that place? Um, we rehearsed for over a month. Um, and it was during the summertime, so I got a lot of time, I, I had a lot of time with her. We skateboarded a lot, I taught her how to skate. Um, and uh, we, we just talked through every scene though. 
and I just helped her understand why the scene was important or existed and what her function in sort of the machine was for each scene. And um, so, you know, the, for those difficult scenes, it was important for me to help her understand w why it's happening and put her kind of in the space of, um, you know, the first person. Um, so, you know, in this scene, you know, you want to talk about your mom. Your mom died, you know, maybe um, your mom died uh, when you were very young. Was How she improvising a lot of around bullet points rather uh, than going line for line? No, because, because we had done a lot of rehearsals uh, she had known the lines, and of course, I would let her change it if it was within uh, context. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty, pretty on on script. That just shows how, yeah, how how talented she is. That's incredible. And you know, just just you know, this film when you watch it, she is very tomboyish. She's kind of like she runs really goofy, and uh, but in real life, she's so prissy. She's <laughs> like, you know, she's uh, she, she, she her favorite color is pink. You know, she's so well-mannered, and she's just a sweetheart. But in this film, she's just, like, kind of, like, uh, gruff and... She rips it up. She rips it up, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long... <laughs> Do you guys, like, rip it up? <laughs> how long did it take you to write the script? Uh, so I wrote... I outlined for two months. Um, I wrote a first draft in <laughs> around two, three months, and I did about seven rewrites <laughs> within, like, a seven-month period. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty intense process. Yeah. Um, yeah. you, so then you go to your actors, and how did you find your actors outside well, of uh, who, the woman who play, the girl who plays Camille? Uh, well, you know, David, he uh, he's on YouTube. He's like a stand-up comedian, and he also has a YouTube channel. And I've been friends with him for about six, seven years. Um, so I wrote his part for him. Um, uh, Curtis, I he's actually a New York native. He he lives in Jamaica, Jamaica, Queens. And I asked a bunch of indie filmmaker friends in New York who's like the next sort of kid who just, people just don't know about him yet. And everybody was like Curtis Cook Jr. Wow. Um, he's a, such a talented actor and, and uh, he kills it in this film. Um, so I, that's how I found him. I, I talked about how I found Simone. But you know, also another thing is I was looking for an older Korean man and um, I just, I couldn't find anyone uh, that was gonna do well in the film, so uh, I asked my dad. My dad was a child actor in Korea. He acted from 10 to 25, and he did all these black and whites in South Korea, and he, you know, he even has this film where he does this Godzilla film where he's inside the monster's eardrum with like this oversized uh, Q-tip. He's like trying to knock, and I always make fun of him for it. Um, but Your dad in the film. So my dad is in the film. Uh, but he is so freaking hard to work with. He is like the worst. <laughs> he is the worst, man. Like he, you know, when we first started shooting, before we started shooting, he gave me all these stipulations. He said, no shooting after nine o'clock. And I'm like, half my film is at night, dad. Like, how, how are you gonna do this to me? He's like, uh, I get to pick my own wardrobe. I'm like, I'm the director, okay? But like, you know, he was, uh, he, he, uh, you know, so Scorsese has all those stories about how difficult it was to work with his mother, who he really? put in all of his movies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He said on Mean Streets in the scene where uh, the woman's having the seizure in the hallway, yeah. his mother was trying to direct the scene, and he started <laughs> he started cursing her out on set in front of him. He's like, Mom, you're not the director. Like, oh stop God. it. Yeah, that's, that seems about right. Yeah, that's pretty similar to, to what I experienced. Never escape being their child, no matter like how much money is on the Never. line or like, how big yeah. the project is. But it was cool, because once, once he got on set, he was pretty... You know, he treated me like the director, but as soon as we would wrap uh, filming for the day, he would be like, he would flex his muscles. He'd be like, Justin. <laughs> and I'd come over and he'd be like, you know, um, you know, uh, we got to go to dinner that one day. And I told you to pick up the dry cleaning from me. Like, it was like, <laughs> he had to make sure that he was a godfather when, when, the, when everything was done, you know, so. He still needed to maintain his supremacy. His supremacy, his hierarchy, man. He wanted to make sure I was beneath him. How did you, did you handle that as like, like a good director and just sort of play along with him to make sure that he was happy? Or did you re revert back to like a teenager and was like, dad, no. Uh, I, I would like to say that I, I kept my cool and I was like trying to be, you know, manipulative director and, and thinking ahead. No, I was a teenager. I was like, dad, yeah. leave me alone. Would have done the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm the director. I'm just a director get out of now. here. God, I have, to, I have to go talk to my actors. Jeez. 
Now, this is the second feature that you've directed, right? Yes. Was this one tougher than, than, than your last, or did you learn a lot on your first one that sort of helped you on this one? I'm, I am so proud of my first film because it's, I basically made it for my 12-year-old self. It is so stupid. Mm-hmm. It's like, when you watch it, you're like, what is this? But basically, if I was 12 and I made a film, that's what that would be. But I learned so much um, about about directing, and and uh, I wouldn't have been able to make this film without making that film. And yes, this film was much harder to make because just budgetary reasons, and and also um, the subject matter, I, because I had to respect uh, what I was talking about, and um, also our shooting schedule. You know, it was just you know this film was just harder to do. Yeah. Well, what was your toughest scene to shoot? Um. I would say the toughest scene was my favorite scene, which is when Camilla and uh, uh, Keith, they're talking about their mom and what she was like um, when she was alive. And, uh, you know, I'm an actor, so I get, I get you know, I'm, uh, I get pretty emotional about things. And, and uh, I was behind the, the, the monitors watching them and I'm trying to direct and I just was crying. And I wrote it, and my producer just, like, kicked me in the back. He's like, come on, snap out of it. <laughs> you wrote it like you, you loser. You need to direct the yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah, you need to direct the scene. But I just thought it was so beautiful because, for me, it was such a proud moment. I, I had written the scene, and I hoped that it would have the emotional p- impact that I was envisioning. And when it did, I just, it, it was so rewarding. Um, also, I was so thankful to the actors that they can, they can bring the dynamics to make that happen. And then, you know, the, the scene after that is very sort of violent. And um, that was also very, very hard to shoot. But, uh, but um, Simone was such a pro um, that she made it easy for me. Now, the title of the film is, uh, for most people, a racial slur. Yeah. Uh, you sort of talk about the history of the, of the slur in the film. We see a little bit of that in the trailer. Was, uh, did, any, did you have any hesitation titling the movie this? Or did you just know that it was, gonna be the, that it was the right title and you stuck to it? Absolutely. Um, the title's not meant to have shock factor. Uh, the title for me is a necessity. And, you know, I got, when we got into Sundance, I got a lot of... Which I have to say, congratulations thank you. for getting thank into you. Sundance. Yeah. Um, thank you. We, uh, we won the Audience Award for the next division. Just, just, just to throw it out there. So, congratulations so on winning the Audience it, Award. Guys. Yeah, audiences <laughs> love it. So you guys should go watch it. But and uh, you are audiences. Yeah. So. Um, but... Um, it wasn't meant to be, a sh- you know, shocking. It's, I, it was an opportunity to educate. And uh, gook, uh, the, the word, uh, this racial slur was, you know, originated during the Korean War. You know, people, uh, in the, but in the Korean language, it means country. Um, so, mi gook, when people say mi gook, mi gook saram, that means a uh, Korean person. Um, Miguk is America, and what that actually, uh, the direct translation is, me is beautiful, Guk is country, so it means beautiful country. For some reason, GIs turned it around and made it derogatory, uh, a derogatory term, and it was an opportunity for me to talk about the word, and during a time of racial tension and, and you know, kind of this adversarial relationship between African Americans and, and Koreans, um, you know, the term Guk it was just was so fitting that we talk about what that means. And if you see the scene where, where Camilla asks Eli, because it's spray painted on the hood of their car, someone spray paints it on their hood um, as a hateful comment, Eli doesn't go there. He, because you know he's talking to an 11 year old, he decides, you know what, I'm gonna tell her the, the actual meaning of what that word is. So uh, it was a good opportunity for me to uh, talk about the brass tacks of, of what that that word actually means and not the derogatory term. So it's in my way, it's a, a way of taking the power away from the word. Um, and also for, you know, the shocking thing is, I, I've talked to a lot of kids in high school, they don't even know what it, it means. And so like a lot of people on set when we were shooting, they were pronouncing it wrong, which maybe is a good thing because they aren't even privy to, to how hurtful that, that word is. But at the same time, I'm like, wow. In particular, it is like particular to the Korean War and, and Vietnam as exactly, well. Exactly, Vietnam as well. Yeah, yeah carried over. Yeah. Um, so. Of course it carried over. Americans are just like, whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> You're the same, which is very insulting, but yeah. Insanely insulting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
almost as insulting as the slur, as using the slur itself or co-opting the slur. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have to ask. I want to go back to the Lahane thing just for a second because uh, I love Lahane and and I and I really like your film. And it's rare that a filmmaker wants to sort of own the homage that they're that they're using, which it oh, yeah. seems like you did here, where it's like you came up with this idea and you were like, this feels very much like Lahane. Rather than try to shy away from it, you were like, no, let's actually just own it. And if people know that movie, they know it almost like is an entry point into what we're doing. Well, you know, it's always great to give context to, to something you have, right? And um, Lahane, I mean, for, I'm, I'm a cinephile. I love film. So you got to give credit where credit is due. So if you bought, I mean, steal from the best, you know, steal from genius, and that's okay with me. So I, I want to give credit to my influences. Um, and, you know, when we were doing, you know, sort of the, the, the festival run, a lot of people were uh, comparing it to, to Spike Lee's work. I'll take it because I'm a huge fan of Spike. But, but um, you know, uh, I, I purposely made a conscious decision that I, I wasn't going to revisit, you know, and watch Spike stuff. But it just it's just osmosis. <clears throat> it's in there. <clears throat> well, you also have you also have the the idea of a riot. You have uh, the 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 sort of conclusion of the film feels very similar to the to the conclusion of Do the Right Thing in, in, in some ways. But at the same time, it doesn't feel I when I was watching I was like I love that he's going for Lahane here and I would yeah. get echoes of Spike because you kind of just can't have this conversation yeah. without Spike me Spike Lee's films and being Ab involved absolutely and just to even be considered like a mix of those two is a huge honor you did a good me. job thank you yeah. yeah yeah but you know yeah I mean you know and there's a t they, some people have picked it up like because it is black and white and it is 90s like there is like a, a tinge of clerks in there you know I, I do a homage of for one joke uh, that is a very <clears throat> Kevin Smith type of joke um, but I, I you know I'm an amalgamation of of you know what I've seen and experienced through film yeah, yeah. absolutely let's get some questions from the audience who right here Hi. so after uh, seeing all the success that this has brought you do you think that you're gonna continue to make more films like this or is there another like realm that you want to <clears throat> kind of delve into that you haven't yet or um, <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, uh, I don't want to be defined by one thing. Just like in, in, as an actor, I've done roles that are just so all over the place. Um, and I would like to just be a storyteller and, and you know, uh, have, you know, content just kind of filter through my lens, which happens to be Asian American male. Um, and just to go back to, to this, uh, this film, it was really important to me because I represented two very underrepresented demographics, which are Asian American males and uh, African American females. And just a little bit of backstory, Camilla was originally um, Kamal and was a guy character, and I thought it was a great opportunity to have a strong, resilient female character, which is why I changed it to, you know, so this, this is just, you know, my sort of, if you will, filmmaker's agenda. Um, but a question I have for you guys is, do you think my, my shorts are too short? <laughs> I feel like a little, you know. Be honest. You know, I feel like, you know, I don't know, like, you know. Like yeah, yeah. I saw that video of the romper on, on YouTube, and I was like, big ups. That's your G for, for doing that. I bought five. <laughs> Did you buy? <laughs> uh, next question. Hey, Justin. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what, how important was it for you to capture the, uh, the time period that uh, your movie takes place in? And because, how difficult yeah. was it for you to capture the time period? Because you're on a limited budget, you're doing a period piece. What were the sort of strategic decisions that you made? Store I'm sorry, I'm building off of your question. He just uh, took over. You just took over his question. Look, I'm, I'm the one with the microphone up here. <laughs> uh, but, you know, building off of that question, what sort of within the script when you were writing it decisions did you make narratively that would help you sort of build this world cost effectively absolutely um so it was very difficult um with a limited budget it, it, you know it's uh, from the script phase i knew what my sort of challenges were going to be so i kind of wrote it to be very lean there's not a lot of locations um, but when you watch the film, it doesn't feel like there's not a lot of locations. Um, so I use what I had, and there are certain things. Like, you know, I, the main car that, that Eli drives, it's a very classic, uh, if you're into cars and drifting, it's a very classic drift car. It's a Toyota AE86, and um, that was from 80, 1986, and it was a quintessential drift car. 
Um, but it's from 86 because, you know, 92, there was a lot of crossover from the 80s in terms of music, um, you know, dressing, you know, how people dress. So that's how I infused, you know, there's a the tinge of the 80s in, in my film. Uh, a lot of the source music with, with um, uh, that comes from car stereos and, and, you know, speakers are all very late 80s, early 90s inspired. Um, so every chance I got, that's, that's what I did. But, but for the musical score, the, co the, the com composition of music was more like French, whimsical inspired music. But um, for the source music, is very like, uh, you know, Beastie Boys-esque and, you know, Tribe, Tribe Called Quest-esque and because I couldn't afford that music, but um, yeah. I think we have time for one more right here. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious, since this film has uh, obviously done so well, um, do you have any other scripts in the making for future films? Uh, yeah. I have a script that I'm writing uh, with this guy, Sal Paskowitz. He wrote Age of Adeline. I don't know if you guys know that film or not. Um, and Blake Lively? Where yes. He, yeah, okay. Yeah, with Harrison Ford. <laughs> I didn't mean that to be pejorative sounding. Yeah, yeah, I just I was yeah. trying to remember what the oh, movie was. It was a beautiful was. film, yeah, and he he did a great job. But we're writing a surf, um, surf road trip film in the vein of like Itu Mama Tambien in, into the wild, which I'm really proud of. And then also uh, I'm doing a book adaptation right now, uh, based off this book called Counting by Sevens. Um, and I'm how's that? How do you find doing a book adaptation versus uh, writing your own script? It's it's great in a way because you have a roadmap and you have within, you know, but then also there needs to be some sort of creation to make it a film and not just a strict adaptation. Um, also a fair amount of creation sometimes to be able to uh, remove certain things from the book that are going to be, are, are going to sort of set the running time back. Absolutely. So, you know, you got to try to pick your battles. Um, but it's been fun because it's, it's also like a challenge and, and you want to respect what the magic of the book was. Um, and then lastly, I'm trying to get this thing off the ground. It's, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I won't really go into it too deeply, but uh, it has something to do with uh, international adoption. Um, but uh, it's something that, you know, films for me, I feel, need to be th filtered through me. And if I'm really passionate about it, then I think it'll, it'll resonate with audiences. So those are the type of stories and, and type of material that I'm looking for to make as a director. Oh, and then also I'm, I'm on the show as an actor uh, on ABC called Deception. Um, that'll, be, that'll be coming out mid-season. Wow. How do you find all the time to, uh, to write and adapt and direct while you're on a show and auditioning and stuff? Um, crack, cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> it does the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, just, I love what I do, so it doesn't feel like work. Right. Um, that was a joke, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was? No, yes. I've never done crack. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you know, I love what I do, so it doesn't really feel like work. And I just, I, and I try to, you know, manage my time. But um, it's hard. And, uh, you know, a uh, TV show is going to be amazing. But I'll have weekends. And I'll have, <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of these things that I'm writing, you know, I have writing partners, so... We can we can kind of pass the torch back and forth. You'll have time in the trailer. You'll have days where you're not working. And Absolutely. Like yeah. One hundred percent. Congratulations on Gook. It opens in L. A. on August eighteenth, right? Yeah. Or August? Uh, is it eighteenth in L. A. August eighteenth in ArcLight and L. A. Live, and August twenty fifth uh, in a lot of major cities, including Union Square, um, Regals. So. Amazing, Justin Sean, everybody. Yeah. Justin, thanks Thank so you. much for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>